to say we have tea and coffee after the service. Do stick around, we'd love to get to know you. Um, this morning as well, I want to just talk to you again about Alpha. We, um, a couple of weeks ago, you'll remember, we all put names down of people that we might like to invite to Alpha. We'll put them in this box. Last week, we had these invitations as well, and they're on your seats today. We also, this morning, have another story to tell. So I'm going to invite Nessie to come. You remember two weeks ago as well that Mike and Fraser came and shared their story of Alpha. So Nessie's going to do the same. Nessie, you did Alpha a while ago, but your story is brilliant. Tell us yes. what yes, happened. I did Alpha 24 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in March. Some of you here today probably will know my story. If you knew me 24 years ago, as a lot of you won't. <coughs>
measurement, so just step against the wall to the measurement. Size 39, and so it's found here. Um, so this is a Friday, and it was Friday coffee. So I set off without doing any coffee, and I was just telling everybody it was a lovely Friday coffee morning because I was excited and everybody wanted to hear the story. And finally, I caught up with Laura, who heard it fully, and she said to me, I wouldn't have said this to you. But now that you've stayed in the feeling for the healing, I want to tell you that when I was holding your arm, I really felt movement in your body. And she said it was the good, I think so it was quite the moment for that small ride, wasn't it? Um, and so she really felt something had happened in my body. So as far as I'm concerned, does God heal today? Yes. I am truly blessed <laughs> and I'm incredibly thankful and grateful to God for being happy. I've got to start to be friends with the moment, so if you would like to come or you're praying for someone, then keep praying for them. The invitations are there. The worship team are going to lead us now. <laughs>
name is Tony Stephen. I get to be the minister here at the West Church. And um, now is the time when we bring our young folk to the front. So let's have all kids come to the front, young folk come to the front, and we tell them a story. And usually we work our way all the way through the Bible story, but this morning we're going to do something slightly different. So this morning we have set a table, haven't we? The table behind me has got a cloth on it and it's got red stuff and this white stuff here as well. Has anybody else here got a big table in your house where you eat around? Yes. Has it got a tablecloth on it? <laughs> 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 um, sometimes we make a special occasion, we have a special occasion in our homes, we certainly do in our house, and we invite people around and we pretend that all the time our house is hoovered, everything's <laughs> tidy, and it's always like this. And then people come around and say, oh yeah, the place is lovely, you, you, you prepared for this coming, we say, no, it's always like this. <laughs> and of course, that's not true, because when we have guests, we want to do something special. And in the Jesus' time, his families, the family he was in, and everybody else who were part of the Jewish family, had a big occasion every year called Passover. And Passover, they would have a special meal. They would get the house ready, they would set the table, they would put a tablecloth, they would have all sorts of different food on it. And they'd get all their children involved as well, and they would ask them questions during the meal, and they would ask them different questions about the meal. But Jesus, very near the time when he went onto the cross and he died, had the same sort of meal with his friends. And things weren't so great. Things weren't looking so great for them. People were angry with them. The Romans were starting to look for them. People and their own friends were even starting to say that they were saying the wrong thing. And he still had this meal. And at one point in the meal, he took a cup of wine. And we don't have wine here. We've just got juice this morning. And he also took bread, slightly different bread, like the flat bread they would have had. And they were expecting him to talk about an old story where God saved them and got through a man called Moses. But instead he said, no, he said, this bread and this wine, from now on, when you get together and have this meal, I want you to remember my body and my blood, because it's a really sad story about Jesus that he ended up dying on a cross. And we've come through that as we've gone through the Bible story time and time again. But the good part of that story is it's not the end of a story. Jesus was raised to life as God said a big yes to everything that he'd been about and he then gave us this new meal that we have every so often here together in church about once a month and we have it together where we take the bread and the wine and it reminds us that we get to join in and take part in what God is doing because of everything that Jesus did in his life and his death and his resurrection. So we're going to do that today like we do every so often. Sometimes we do it later in the service and you guys are in junior church. But today we're going to do it all together. So we need to get ready for that. So first of all, you need to go back to whoever brought you here. And then, with everybody who's here, we need to get ready, which means we all need to get a piece of bread and a cup of wine. So there's a whole lot set up in this table here. I'm going to let our servers come and get themselves organized before I invite everybody to come up. And then when our servers are ready, Loving God, through your goodness, we have this bread and this grape juice. 
which has come forth from the earth. Human hands have crafted it. May we know through that your presence as we share. And may we know your touch and presence in all things. We celebrate the life you give, the life that Jesus has shared among his community through the years and that he shares with us now. Made one in Christ, one with each other, in your spirit. We offer these gifts and with them ourselves, a single living act of praise. And as we do in this place what you did in that upstairs room, send down your spirit on us on these gifts of bread and wine, that they may become for us your body, healing, forgiving, making us whole, so that we may become for you your body, loving, caring in this world until your kingdom comes. Amen. Lord Jesus, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Here is your Lord coming to you in bread and wine. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Just where you are, please now take the bread and wine. Your peace is not an insignificant peace, not a conditional peace, not a half-hearted peace, but the shalom, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ with us now. Let's take a moment to share it with each other. Maybe it's a wave, a handshake, a hug, depending who it is you're with, but let's say this be the peace. So one or two things to share with you this morning. The first, I believe, is an image, a photo we should have of a wedding. There we are. So Maria and Cliff are married on the 29th here in the West Church. And a fantastic celebration on that day. So congratulations to them. Thanks to everyone who's involved and made it such an amazing day. And the next thing to let you know about is that we had a little stall, and Annabelle had a little stall at the end of church um, last Sunday. And um, the amount which keeps changing that has been raised for Nansatu in our space in Malawi is £273.32, plus £5 pounds that she was given right before, so hasn't done that at maths yet, but £278.32. So, <laughs> Some of you will be aware that um, Greg Lister and Lucy Lister have been part of our church for many years and Greg has worked for us as youth coordinator and then more recently leading music and worship and getting involved in the creative media and our online stuff. Um, and they're now moving to a new opportunity in Australia. Um, Lucy has a job there as a teacher and they're both going out there to start a new adventure. So they're going out in September, Greg's last Sunday is going to be in August. And for those of you who want to show your appreciation, we're going to be having a collection over the next few weeks. So there's a different bowl out in the welcome area and if you want to give just put it in an envelope with uh, uh, Greg's name on that or if you want to give through the church or through the, the contactless machine you can do that as long as you put Greg Lister as the um, reference to that or you can let us know how you'd like to do that so I'm sure we'd like to, to give thanks for Greg and everything he's done and wish them well and pray for them over the next few weeks as they make all their preparations. And then the last opportunity, I think, is we have uh, different teams in church that encourage us in different ways, discipleship team, pastoral team, fellowship and hospitality. And these teams don't do stuff for us, they encourage us together to do things for each other. And one of those teams is known as the outreach team, and it looks at local and global. So things like the after course, ways we can reach out to our community, our food bank, ways that we can help, and also further afield, things like International Justice Mission, uh, Visa Nurseries in Malawi, Christian Aid. Um, and it's headed up by Sally Cooper. That team is meeting this week on Wednesday, uh, uh, Thursday, sorry, Thursday this week at 12 o'clock in the Murray Room, which is one of the rooms here in our buildings. And um, all of these teams are open. Anybody who'd be willing to be involved in any way can be part of that. And that would be fantastic if you think that's something you can be involved in. Chris, can you just take us on the actual recording phone that's got? Oh, you're working for us. Uh, yes. uh, this is the alpha reminder. Oh, it's a reminder. <laughs> a reminder to get all of the <laughs> Thank you very much. So, if you want to get involved, and in, uh, it's just hearing more about how we get involved and how we all each other get involved in things, then either contact me, contact Sally, or come along on Thursday at 12 o'clock. You're more than welcome to hear more about what is happening. With that, I'm going to invite
today I'm just going to do my reading from this morning. This morning the reading is taken from the Holy Bible, New International Version, Jeremiah 4, verses 23 to 28. I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore the earth will mourn, and the heavens above grow dark, because I have spoken. I will not relent, I have decided, and will not turn back. May God bless the reading of this word. If you get the first slide up, please. This is our set of questions that we're looking at at the moment with this theme. So the first question is, is this the real life? And behind that is this idea that we are all living, but is the life we're living the one we were made for, the one that we hoped for, and questions around that. And then the second question goes along with it, is this just fantasy? And the reason behind that question for me at the moment is just that there's an awful lot being said in lots of different ways, and it's very difficult to discern what is real and what is true. <coughs> is this something false that's been presented to me, a promise that's been made that can't be fulfilled? These kinds of questions. Next slide. I want you to imagine, just for a minute, <coughs> imagine being part of a fairly small country in the world that used to have far more influence, that used to be much more important in the world. In fact, maybe almost had been part of an empire across the world. And now this small country is in bad shape, that things are actually, it feels like things are falling apart. There's been a succession of leaders who have been either incompetent or corrupt or both. And that's led to this country having a much different role in the world stage. World superpowers have been pushing backwards and forwards, trying to influence in different ways and affecting you. Um, there's been conflicts all around that sometimes you've been sucked into or not through your own choice. And even within your own society, things are becoming difficult. The poorest are getting poorer and a small group of those who have control and have control of the power of riches are getting richer and richer and exerting more and more control. Now I know that's hard to imagine, but this is a situation in <coughs> like 600 years before the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And it's in a scrap of land called Judah, which is what is left of the land of Israel because the northern tribes have been lost. And at this point, their country, that at one point under King David and King Solomon almost extended to an empire, is now really in ruins. Different empires have come and gone, sometimes taken over, certainly affecting them from the north and the south. And into that situation, a young man probably in his late teens, called Jeremiah, is inspired, reluctantly, to start standing up and announcing in their capital city what he believes God is saying, God's words. And as we've seen in the first few chapters of his book, which is collected for us in the first part of this collection of books we call the Bible, the message, it seems, that God has got for his whole nation in this particular situation is to come back, to turn around, to come back and understand who you were made to be. And it's been a desperate, desperate set of pleas that we've heard so far. Well, in chapter four, next slide, we find that there's a slight difference because here we we'll suddenly have a whole set of images, ideas, metaphors that are around complete disaster, and in particular disaster from the north. And as we get into this, there's a few things that's helpful, I think, as I read it, is to understand. And the first is that this is not a story, as in a 
a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's not a narrative that tells you about a set of events or even about a person. Although unusual, unlike some of the other prophets that are mentioned in the Bible, Jeremiah is one that we do get a little bit about his life and certainly his own personal feelings and his situation through this book. Instead, what we have here is a collection. We have a collection that's possibly even written down by somebody else on Jeremiah's behalf. It's a collection of prophecies. And prophecy is an interesting thing in the Jewish way of thinking. Because often we think about a prophet or prophecies about prediction. Somebody who knows what's going to happen in the future. But that's entirely incorrect when you're thinking about these kind of prophecies. Someone who was a prophet is someone who had a message. A message for either a leader or a particular person or a whole group of people often. And that message often was about what might happen or what could happen or what would happen if something else didn't happen. But the message was nearly always actually a message about action and often a message about change. And that message was communicated in all sorts of different ways, sometimes not even through words. It was through art and inspiration, and it was all designed to really shock and provoke people to get through what God was trying to get. And what we have here is a collection. And so we put it, called it chapter four in this collection, but it's really a whole set of different poems and announcements that Jeremiah would have made crammed into one, so it doesn't logically need to make sense. Yes, the person who's put together is also inspired and they've co collected together the same sorts of bits and material. But why we get to suddenly this disaster is, next slide, that this is not prediction as such. This is inspiration. That Jeremiah is inspired to, 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 to <coughs> provoke people with these words. And it's almost, next slide, as if he's saying, imagine, put up the next slide, sorry. Imagine what could happen. So the situation is there in this country, Judah, uh, capital city, Jerusalem, what's left of the Jewish nation at this point. And here we have an announcement about potential disaster from the north. And that makes potential, yeah, absolute sense. Whether it's Assyria or whether it's Babylon, that's exactly where invaders are going to come from if they're not coming from Egypt. And so this is something that is also likely to happen. However, it comes across more likely as someone saying, imagine the worst comes to the worst. Next slide. And these are the consequences. So this is not a prediction, this is not even later on written about something that actually happened and then bringing it back to the cause. This is imagine if the worst happens and it is disaster and it, of course it's completely likely that they will, in fact they are invaded often from the north. Next slide. <coughs> what comes across is a mixture and sometimes it's hard to hear this. Sometimes what comes across we feel is all about anger, because here we're going to have a whole lot of talk about disaster and destruction. But in the middle of that, what Jeremiah is inspired to say is, put on sackcloth, lament, and wail. And this is balance between an idea of anger and the idea of lament, about crying out, about the people crying out, but also about Jeremiah crying out, and about God crying out. And people time and time again will talk to you, and certainly talk to me about why are there two different gods in this collection of books we call the Bible? The Old Testament God that's all about anger and the New Testament God that's all about love and peace. And I have to keep coming back to them and saying, if we engage, if we wrestle, if we work our way through these things, I find exactly the same God in all the pages and in all the references throughout the Bible. God is angry. God gets angry about all sorts of things in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. Very seldom is he angry with his people. He is disappointed, he is heartbroken, he is angry with evil, he's angry with consequences, he's angry with injustice, and his anger comes out in ways that he has to deal with those things. And those who are wrapped up in those things end up suffering the same consequences, because he's a God who's also good, who has to get rid of things that are destructive. But his anger is very rarely for individuals. Or for <coughs> so he has anger, and it's mentioned here from on, on this. Next slide. But he's also full of lament. His anger is directed at the evil, at the injustice, at the things that are pulling apart his creation project and affecting his children. Next slide. We've got an imaginary day here, and all the way through Jeremiah's uh, prophecies, Jeremiah's poems, Jeremiah's songs, Jeremiah's chants, there's a common thread that comes back that one of the groups that God is angry with 
are the leaders of the people. And they're often grouped in these four. The king, who's supposed to be the servant of God. The officials, who are supposed to be helping people to be who they're made to be. The priests, who are supposed to be connecting them with the God and reminding them. And the prophets, who are supposed to be bringing messages from their God about who they're made to be and how they can be part of what he is doing. And time and time again, Jeremiah is saying that they're failing. They're failing because they're, these particular people are only interested in either keeping themselves in power or making themselves even richer or just keeping things calm so that things aren't, um, that they, they aren't in trouble. And that's a complete failure. Our new Prime Minister announced in his first speech that he believed government was there to serve the people. A Prime Minister, the word minister means to serve a servant. The Prime Minister is the number one servant in the country. That's the ideal. Kings were made to help the people live in justice and in peace as servants and, servants, and that has been lost. Next slide. Jeremiah then even gets to the point where he appears to be accusing God of being behind what's going wrong. So in verse 10 he says, how completely you've deceived your people, saying it's all fine, you'll have peace, when in actual fact the sword is at our heels. What we miss in the, the, the way this Jewish piece is written is the sarcasm. That Jeremiah has been talking about the prophets of the day. And the prophets of the day were going around saying, look, everything's fine. God puts people in charge. This is the way things are supposed to be. Just behave, pay your taxes, carry on with things. And in actual fact, Jeremiah is being sarcastic and saying, if these are the prophets of God, then they're saying everything is fine. And in actual fact, the reality is very different, which proves they are, next slide, absolutely false. That this is fake news. Next, fake news. This is just the kind of things we're being promised that are meant to just keep us quiet, but aren't cutting through to the actual truth of the situation. Next slide. But Jeremiah's words aren't just for the leaders. Because when he talks about God's anger with the situation, he doesn't talk about God being angry with individuals because they've been naughty. He actually talks about God being angry with the consequences being played out. But the root behind that is the choices that people have made. So here in verse 18, he says, Your own conduct and actions have brought this on you. This is your, in an English translation, someone's decided to make that punishment. But the Hebrew word there is actually the same word for evil and the same word for disaster. This is your disaster. This is your evil. This is the consequences of the choices you've made. And how bitter it is, and it pierces you. It pierces my heart, God's heart, because he's not an angry, peeved, irritated God. He's a broken-hearted God at this point. Next slide. And the next slide. Jeremiah, sometimes we can't even tell which are his words and which are God's words. And here he talks about just how much this affects him and his heart. In fact, that's why he bursts. He doesn't want to be a young man being ignored or being laughed at for all these things he's saying. Instead, he can't keep silent because this bursts out all of him. Next slide. He talks in ways that he wants to shock the people. My people are fools, he's saying, God is saying, because they don't know me. And that word know is about relationship. Time and time again, Jeremiah is going to come back to this problem that they were made, God's people were made to be in a relationship with God, in a relationship with the creation, to put them in a relationship with each other, and to be part of making that reach its potential. And as soon as they start ignoring any of those things, then that's when things go wrong. They have no understanding. They end up just doing destructive things. And becoming even good, really good at doing destructive things instead of doing what they were made for. Next slide. And the part that I had us Adele read out for us this morning is perhaps the one that would have been the most striking for those who are wandering past or actually listening to Jesus <coughs> reading these words after some of the disasters that did happen to their people. Because here, Jeremiah goes into a poem that has a rhythm to it. There's a repetition. I looked and I looked and I looked at him and he describes different things happening. And the first thing he describes is he says, I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty. Fairly flat for us in English. English. However, all his Jewish listeners would be immediately thinking back to the very first set of poems in this collection that are the creation poems in Genesis. And there it describes how everything was formless and empty. 
And Morimna has a rhythm to that. The next slide. In the Hebrew, it's tohu va bohu. So much of that rhymes and has rhythm to it. And they'd have heard that phrase here again, where formless and empty is mentioned again. And then this is description of light disappearing, and then animals disappearing, and then human beings disappearing. And what's happening in Jeremiah's poem, the next slide, is uncreation. This is the creation poem about how God who took chaos and then he made it into something ordered that was then going to be able to eventually hopefully fulfill its potential. And here, because of their people's choices, they are effectively taking that and they are putting it in reverse order where creation is pulling itself apart. And it was hard to imagine that humanity could get in a position where they were actually threatening creation itself by their own choices. But Jeremiah is trying to shock them by saying this is the opposite of what our God is doing. Next slide. And then it seems bleak. And believe me, I've worked my way a bit through Jeremiah 40 in preparation for how we're going to be going. And it is hard going. There's a lot of disaster. And even Jeremiah is going to lose patience at some point. But through it, threaded through it, and we have to search for it because there's a lot of dark things happening. Well, it says here, one of the Lord's messages, the whole land will be ruined. It's then immediately followed up. And here we get a sense of God's personality being coming through these words. Though I will not destroy it completely. Though I will not destroy it completely. And this is what the people, this is what Jeremiah, this is what I have to hold on to. That while things seem like they're at their worst, this is a God who doesn't give up. As angry as he might get, as terribly as he might feel about how badly his people come again and again and again turn against him and ignore him. He never gives up. Even though he, he feels like he wants to at some points, he then immediately reminds himself, I will not destroy it completely. This is not the end. He will not let this project fail. Next slide. He is, and this is the final part of this kind of set of poems, the God who hears the cry. And there's this image of hearing a cry of someone in distress, a woman in labor who is in the middle of a city being attacked and who is the most vulnerable. And that's how God feels about his people. His daughter is Zion, Zion is just another word for Jerusalem. God is a God. And this was a story in Moses reminded for us in the Passover festival and every time we come back around this table. That God is the God, next slide, who hears the cry. That our God is a God who will never give up. As dark as things get, he hears the cry and he acts to rescue the slaves, to give himself and his life and his death and his resurrection, to take away everything that gets in the way, to enable the opportunity for his project to move forward and that creation, dream and vision to actually become a reality as we see it described at the end of Revelation, with God living in a restored creation, everything made new with his people. God is a God who hears the cry, even when everything else seems like it's falling apart. And that is the comfort, but it's also the challenge, because Jeremiah, he is bursting with this. He's moved to the point where he can't stop doing this. And he wants his people to do the same, to respond. And so the challenge is not just to remember that God is the God who hears the cry, but to ask ourselves, are we next like the people who hear the cry? Let's take a couple of minutes of silence to reflect. Amen. Can I invite these musicians to come and get ready for the last couple of songs? <coughs> um, I absolutely love Nessie's story that she shared this morning. Um, just to remind you that you don't need to have um, some sort of healing problem that you want to come to Alpha. You don't need to come to Alpha uh, for any reason. And also, you don't have to have something you know, deeply serious like that that you need prayed for if you would like someone to pray with you. And we've got a number of people here in the morning who are delighted to pray with you and do with you, no matter how trivial it may seem. So we'll get them to stand up just to, so we can see who you are. So again, during the music or after when we're having our tea and coffee, if you feel like you'd like someone to pray with you, then please see one of those folks. Let's all stand <laughs> together. <laughs>
you have put your life in our hands. Now we put our lives into yours. Take us, renew and remake us. What we have been is past, what we shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us on, take us with you. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you all, now and always. Grace and peace. Amen. Please, if you can, do stick around and spend some time with us. Love us all time.